As the flight date draws near, SpaceX continues to captivate space enthusiasts with its ever-evolving plans that seem to shift by the hour. The main gun of the flight, Booster 7, is no longer on the orbital launch mount. This development was triggered by the ship quick disconnect arm retracting yesterday. Following this, chopsticks were raised slowly and gave Booster 7 a gentle embrace. SpaceX then employed the two giant arms attached to the pad's launch tower to lift the towering rocket off the launch mount. While Elon Musk has stated that the ultimate goal is to use these arms to catch Starship and Super Heavy out of mid-air, their current purpose is to replace the cumbersome crane that would otherwise be required to lift either stage. These arms are a highly intricate solution that enables SpaceX to remotely lift, install, and remove Starship stages while insulating these processes from wind conditions, which cranes are sensitive to. And as for Booster 7, without official information, it is impossible to determine why it was lifted off. However, after the schedule closure ended, Booster 7 remained at the launch site and there is no indication that it will be moved elsewhere. Hopefully, this is to allow the team to complete the necessary modifications inside the OLM. It's likely that the release mechanisms are being worked on, and it would be beneficial to demonstrate the ability to stack both stages in rapid succession for a launch. In conclusion, the lifting of Booster 7 from the launch mount is a significant development in SpaceX's ongoing efforts to perfect their launch processes. In the meantime, the installation of shields on the orbital launch mount is still ongoing. The shields protect all exposed piping manifolds, control panels, and other components from engine exhaust and debris during liftoff. It may take a few more days to complete. Installation teams are also installing shields around the booster quick disconnect mechanism, and that appears to be almost complete. By now, we're already hoping that this won't delay the flight by much, but now it's becoming evident that the flight may take place in April or later, because it certainly won't be this month. And Musk has also confirmed. Um, so, but we are getting, we are getting close for our first orbital attempt of, of Starship. Um, Hopefully in the next month or so, we'll, we'll have our first attempt. I'm not saying it'll get to orbit, but I am guaranteeing excitement. This is a very difficult program. Um, the, the rocket is roughly two and a half times the thrust of a Saturn V. So if it, want, or, if or once it reaches orbit, it will be uh, by far the biggest rocket to reach orbit. But more importantly, it is designed to be the first fully reusable rocket, orbital rocket uh, ever. So the, the key to uh, extending life beyond Earth is a fully and rapidly reusable orbital rocket. Um, this is a very hard problem given the constraints of, of Earth. With Earth has a thick atmosphere and strong gravity. It is only barely possible to do this. Um, That's why it has not been done before. And when the Starship test flight finally happens, Musk believes that... I don't know, hopefully above 50% chance of reaching orbit. It's now more than 18 months since a Starship prototype last lifted off as part of a series of high-altitude flight and landing tests beginning in 2021. Those test flights were never intended to go to orbit, though they did lead to a few explosive landing attempts as well as a series of impressive belly flop maneuvers. The upcoming orbital test flight will be the first time SpaceX attempts to reach orbit with Starship. It'll also be the first time the company launches its Super Heavy Booster, which is the first stage that will propel the Starship upper stage to orbit. All this towards a future of fully reusable rockets. But not only is Starship aiming for reusability, the entirety of the industry is also moving toward reusing rockets. ULA also announced a design concept for the reuse of the Vulcan booster engines, thrust structure, and first stage avionics, which could be detached as a module from the propellant tanks after booster engine cutoff. The module would re-enter the atmosphere behind an inflatable heat shield. Notably, ULA just completed liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen loading tests on the Vulcan first stage, 
Over the next several days, ULA engineers and technicians will put the rocket through Pathfinder tests to validate the successful performance of the Vulcan and Centaur stages, Vulcan launch platform, pad facilities, and ground support systems. The tanking tests will verify countdown steps, procedures, and timelines and offer the opportunity to certify the launch team through real-world experience operating the hardware. The VLP transported the rocket from the Vertical Integration Facility to Space Launch Complex 41 on March 9th, riding the rails that connect the two locations. The rocket was stacked on the VLP inside the VIF in late January, and a series of readiness checks since then confirmed that the vehicle was ready to move on to launch pad testing. Each tanking day is planned to be lengthy and incorporate extensive special test objectives. The expected duration of tests necessitates two shifts of launch console operators, dividing the crew into the preps and tanking team, and the detanking and securing team. After the tanking tests are accomplished, the VLP will disengage from the pad systems for the transport of the Vulcan rocket to the VIF for the next step in the countdown to the inaugural launch. The first flight includes payloads for three distinctly different missions, deploying two Project Kuiper prototype broadband satellites into low Earth orbit for Amazon, sending Astrobotics Peregrine commercial lunar lander to intercept the moon, and carrying a Celestis memorial payload into deep space. As for our last bit of news, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station Thursday, with 40 more internet satellites for rival OneWeb followed by the landing of the rocket's first stage back at the Florida spaceport eight minutes later. The mission, which is SpaceX's 16th flight of the year overall, was the third and final planned dedicated Falcon 9 launch for OneWeb, which switched launch providers from Russia's Soyuz rocket to SpaceX and Indian rockets last year after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. OneWeb has another reservation with SpaceX for a rideshare mission with Iridium later this year. With the 40 spacecraft on Thursday's mission, OneWeb has launched a total of 585 satellites to date on 17 rockets, 13 Soyuz flights, 3 SpaceX Falcon 9s, and 1 Indian GSLV Mark III. OneWeb has reported two failed satellites in its constellation, meaning the launch Thursday brought the tally of active OneWeb spacecraft to 582. OneWeb has also one more launch on an Indian GSLV Mark III rocket scheduled later this month, with 36 more internet satellites. That launch, scheduled for March 26th, will put OneWeb over the 588 satellite threshold needed for global internet coverage. OneWeb plans to launch nearly 650 satellites in total for its first-generation network, including spares. Today's launch is an exciting milestone as we are now just one mission away from completing our Gen 1 constellation, which will activate global service in 2023, said Neil Masterson. CEO of OneWeb in a statement. Now, more than ever, OneWeb is dedicated to continuing the momentum we have garnered from the past 17 successful launches to innovate alongside our trusted partners and deliver connectivity solutions at scale. Each launch is a group effort and today's success would not have been possible without the dedication of the entire launch team and our partners here in Florida. The contract with SpaceX was surprising to many satellite industry watchers because OneWeb is an indirect competitor in the broadband market. SpaceX sells Starlink service directly to consumers while OneWeb sells to enterprises and internet service providers to provide connectivity for entire businesses or communities. I like to think that this is Musk's way of helping out a fellow internet satellite provider while also helping himself. It's a win-win situation for everyone. And that's it for today's episode. If you appreciate the work my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and we'll see you next time.